All right, welcome everybody uh, to our the RTSO webinar series uh, around COVID-19. And today we're going to have a guest speaker, uh, Rob Bryan, and we're going to talk about repurposing anesthetic gas machines as ICU vents and what are the requirements and some of the considerations that we need to consider and think about as we use these pieces of equipment. I will uh, now just, I'm just gonna do a quick intro and then I'm gonna let Rob get into uh, the meat of the talk and then we'll, we'll, we'll have some time for questions as well afterwards. So again, welcome from the RTSO, all of our board members, myself, Sue Jones, Kelly Hassel, the president elect, uh, she's doing a sim lab uh, exercise right now, so she can't join us today. And then we also have our director, editor in chief, Shauna McDonald, Sue Martin is our treasurer, and uh, Wendy Foote, Sylvia Mortimer, Farzad, Farzad Rafi, and Gino DePinto are all directors at large, each with a different kind of role within uh, the board. And uh, I'll, do, I'll do the roles very well. And then we have some non-voting members, and that includes Nancy Garvey, Mika Noniama, Steve Buziak, Tina Yan, Sylvie, uh, Shirley Quach, and Greg Dondi. And again, each of those people have specific roles um, to help us uh, continue our work around uh, supporting all the RTs in Ontario. So this one, uh, I just wanted to say a big thanks. And every time we do a webinar, we wanna say thank you to, to all of you across the province and for what you're doing for what you're doing for our profession and what you're doing for our patients. And, uh, you know, these are just some photos that I uh, have been sent through various people. Uh, up in the top left is uh, one of my co-workers at RVH in Barrie. Her name is Karen, and she's decked right out in the latest PPE garb. And then myself, we, we, are, we got required to get uh, fit tested for um, the respirators, and uh, we use them in IC right now. And then on the bottom left, uh, it's a group of three RTs from South Lake, and uh, the one in the front with the blonde hair and no cap, she actually used to work with me at RVH. Her name is Tegan and, and a couple of her co-workers. And then a couple of uh, Kelly's co-workers from St. Joe's and Hamilton. So just everybody I know is working really, really hard. And uh, we wanna make sure that you all uh, are thanked as well. And then just a couple updates that we're doing in terms of uh, the uh, work that we're doing with our counterparts, I guess, in the ministry or some of the other work that we're actually doing. So I'm just gonna give you a quick update before we start. Um, we have been having some conversations uh, with Critical Care Services Ontario around the ventilator plan for surge. Now, obviously it hasn't uh, come to fruition in terms of what we anticipated with ICU beds and people on ventilators, but nonetheless, they're still continuing the work because uh, as I'm sure you've heard, there could be a second wave and that could come either through the summer or into the fall likely. So that still is happening. And uh, Kelly and I have been having conversations with uh, uh, the people at Critical Care Services Ontario. So that's that's been happening. We. We participate in specific uh, meetings and calls, and and one of the morning calls around the COVID-19 is with uh, the ministry. There's over 300 organizations that join the call daily. It's a half-hour update on numbers and initiatives from the ministry's per perspective, with 10 to 15 minutes of a, a possibility to ask questions. So we try to get our questions in. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes not, but we do tend to ask a lot of questions around PPEs. PPE concerns, uh, ventilators and the consumables, and lately around aerosol generating uh, medical procedures. We've been doing some interviews, uh, some pieces with different media outlets, and I know other people have across the province, which is fantastic. Always great to see us in the news. Uh, we've been posting resources uh, as they come into the RTSO office at uh, RTSO email site. And we post those on the website and you'll see a COVID-19 tab and also a refresher RT tab uh, for other information around that as well as people start to uh, volunteer to come back into the workforce when needed. Uh, there's also resources um, that we've been, I guess, able to tap into through two other tables that uh, we attend, a collaboration table and a communications table. 
and uh, both of those are driven by the ministry and we are participating on those as well and, and uh, again bring up uh, pertinent issues we have weekly calls with the CRTO. We collaborate on common issues. They've been absolutely fantastic in supporting uh, the dissemination of information and webinars. And oh, obviously we're setting up lots of webinars and starting to plan for Inspire. So Inspire is going to happen, uh, hopefully, as long as there's no shutdown again of the economy, uh, on October 23rd and October 24th at Blue Mountain in Collingwood. And there'll be more information posted probably in May uh, in terms of uh, uh, kind of how you register for, it'll probably start to happen in June and then the agenda. So we're working on that. And as you know, we don't really have any uh, paid staff. So it's all of us doing all of this work. So be patient with us, but we are uh, working through all of that right now. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Rob. So Rob is um, oops. Rob is a respiratory therapist and an anesthesia assistant. Um, he's currently working at McKenzie Health in the Richmond Hill site. Rob's uh, passion about our profession has supported the profession in many, many ways, including volunteering his time to the RTSO as president and on the board for quite some time now. Um, had just stepped down when I came back into the fold. Uh, Rob has great expertise in the realm of anesthetic machines around procurement and all of the equipment around anesthesia and uh, is going to provide us with some of the knowledge and considerations uh, as we move forward with this pandemic planning. So I am going to turn it over to Rob. We are going to use, just because we had a few technical glitches, but we're going to use a PDF and Rob's going to walk through that PDF. So you'll see the screen change. All right, Rob, I'm going to send it over to you to start your presentation. Actually, Sue, if I could ask you a big favor, you're mm -hmm. doing a great job with the slides. So would you mind just handling that part and then I sure. can handle uh, my computer on my end? Sure. Okay. So uh, we'll go to uh, the next slide. So first I'd like to echo uh, Sue's comments and I would like to thank all the respiratory therapists for doing an unbelievable job in the front line. Um, I've been working with my respiratory therapy colleagues at my hospital and I'm blown away by the professionalism and um, this is really what respiratory therapists are made for. This is pure crisis management and we're right in the front line and everybody's doing a great job. I would also like to take this time to thank the RT leadership during this crisis, both locally, provincially, and at a national level for all the guidance and the access to the pertinent and critical resources and information that we need during this pandemic. Um, I also like to especially recognize the RTSO for their advocacy work and representing our profession in the media. It's nice to see respiratory therapists on TV. <laughs> so, um, and ensuring that we're all engaged with our key stakeholders in the province and different government agencies during the crisis. Uh, their function and support during the healthcare system response to this pandemic is exactly why we need a strong professional association and a voice. And I thank all of you guys for your excellent work and your dedication. Okay, so what are we preparing for? So, I mean, I'm sure everybody has seen on the news how this particular virus has been impacting different countries from around the world. Quite scary. So, um, the Ontario government uh, made a pandemic plan that was based off of a model that projected about 80,000 infected patients with a worst case scenario of 300,000. And if you consider the current trends that are showing about 7 to 9% of active cases require hospitalization, and of them, 20 to 25% of them get admitted into the ICU. When you do the math, the numbers appear staggering. So how does Canada compare with respect to other hospitals with availability of hospital beds per capita? So I kind of broke down the numbers based off of some of the more uh, successful countries that had uh, were able to flatten the curve versus some of the countries that have been overwhelmed. So starting with South Korea, which has seen uh, great success mitigating its large outbreak, they actually have more than 12 beds per 1,000 people. And if you look at China, where particularly in the province of Hubei, where Wuhan is, uh, they were quickly overrun they have 4.3 beds per 1,000 people. 
Then you look at a more developed healthcare system like Italy, uh, with a very modern capacity. Uh, they had their hospitals overwhelmed, and they have 3.2 beds per 1,000 people. Something a little closer to home, maybe a little bit more realistic for our model. You look at the United States, they roughly have about 2.8 hospital beds per 1,000 people, and they're seeing some of their biggest city hospitals overrun. You, Canada, by comparison, has about 2.5 beds per 1,000. And out of those 2.5 beds per 1,000, about 1 1.7 beds per 1,000 is dedicated to acute care. I was a little shocked by that when I read that. But this is just me being a little bit of a naive frontline healthcare worker. Um, so, if you consider uh, our limited healthcare resources and our current capacity combined with the projected numbers of the COVID patients requiring mechanical ventilation, our healthcare system is really exposed to an ominous reality of not being able to meet the demand of an unprecedented onslaught of critically ill and dying patients. Fortunately, due to our early implementation of strict social distancing, isolation, and public health strategies, we are beginning to see the numbers of new cases decrease and the curve flattening. At this rate, uh, the path that we're about to hit is, is approximately 20,000 infected in Ontario, much towards the best case scenario versus the worst case scenario, thank God. So the Ministry of Health uh, has since enhanced our emergency ventilator inventory, adding much needed capacity, but there still remains a threat that we may need to use non-ICU style ventilators in an off-label uh, way to cope with any potential or unprecedented surge. So as we saw in China, Italy, Spain, and closer to home the United States, particularly New York, Boston, and Detroit, how quickly their hospitals and healthcare systems were overwhelmed. In addition, we're seeing unprecedented shortfalls and limited access to the tools that we use in our daily practice as the world competes for the same resources, supplies, and equipment to care for these patients. This really highlights how important it is for us to look at for creative ways to plan and redeploy key resources to help save lives. Next slide. Okay, so during the pandemic, most elective surgeries and procedures in Ontario have been canceled, freeing up valuable technologies and anesthesia trained staff that can be redeployed in support of emergency and critical care programs dealing with the surge of critically ill patients, assist with capacity challenges such as staffing and bed spacing, and to help offset projected shortfalls of ventilators. Anesthesia gas machines are highly regulated medical devices and have strict compliances standards and requirements specific to anesthesia clinical applications that have to be met before it can be licensed and approved for sale in Canada. Uh, the anesthetic gas machines are designed for short-term use. They require specific training. They require daily performance checks and maintenance to ensure that it's safe to use and it's ready for operation. Anesthetic gas machines are designed with the attention that there is constant attendance of an anesthesia trained clinician for its operation and safe uh, uh, and for safe use, including uh, expertise in the principles of the operation or the theories of operation, anesthesia specific alarm profiles, troubleshooting, and daily performance checks and calibrations. Now that last part I just said is really the crux of, I think the biggest hurdle that people will have to get over to be able to redeploy or repurpose a gas machine uh, in a non-OR setting with clinicians that don't have the foundational knowledge in applied anesthesia. Unlike ICU ventilators, anesthetic gas machines have a specialized rebreathing system. And these are some of the real important principles that people need to really learn and be comfortable with if they're going to use this as a long-term ventilator on a critically ill patient. Uh, because if you don't really understand these principles very well, um, there's a huge risk to the patient where they can get harmed or can even pass. So I'll go back to this part here, sorry. Okay, unlike ICU ventilators, anesthetic gas machines uh, have a specialized rebreathing system with an adjustable fresh gas flow feature that allows the patient to spontaneously breathe, be manually ventilated or mechanically ventilated as uh, uh, deliver anesthetic gases uh, and waste anesthetic removal as well as scavenging. Uh, it has a CO2 scrubbing 
that has respiratory mechanics and surveillance, including spirometry, flow, volume, and pressure curves and loops and waveforms. It has real-time measurements of inspired, oh, I think we're, we gotta go back a slide there. So real-time measurement of uh, inspired and expired gases, such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, various inhalational agents. Anesthetic gas machines are usually integrated with other technologies, such as physiological monitors, infusion pumps, electronic document stations, as part of an overall anesthesia workstation. If you look up at the picture at the top right-hand corner, the anesthetic gas machine is just part of a bigger integrated uh, workstation that people that work in anesthesia inter, uh, interface with. So modern gas machines are very advanced and they're capable of supporting the ventilatory needs of very sick patients. And they have the ability to be used as part of surge capacity during extreme circumstances, such as uh, the current pandemic. But it's really important to note that anesthetic gas machines have differences in design, workflow, and functionality compared to an ICU ventilator. So we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so. Uh, next slide. So what is off-label use? Um, anesthesia gas machines uh, being utilized outside of their intended use in an OR is considered off-label use and requires specific planning and training before redeploying and operationalizing. Most vendors have provided recommendations and protocols that must be strictly adhered to to ensure safe and proper function for off-label use and during long-term ventilation of the patient. It is important to know that the gas machine uh, are not intended for long-term use and are being repurposed to respond to a critical shortage of ICU ventilators during the COVID pandemic. It's understood that such off-label deployment of these devices has been approved by Health Canada uh, as of March 25th uh, for the use during the existence of this pandemic crisis only. Before utilizing this technology in your practice, as a regulated health professional, it is incumbent on you to be familiar with the device, know the differences in design, function, and use, especially regarding off-label use and the implications on patient safety and care. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more in depth about some of the principles of operations of ventilators, anesthetic gas machines. So um, anesthesia devices have different working principles and different user interfaces than ICU ventilators do. It is important to, oops, sorry here. It is important to learn the principles of operation of the anesthetic gas machine to better understand its clinical application, its limitations, and the care that's required to safely use on a patient. There are two main types of ventilator drivers in the marketplace. They have a pneumatically driven and electrically driven. And the pneumatically driven ventilators require a medical gas, usually oxygen, uh, to power either a solenoid ventilator or a bellows to drive the breath into the patient. Uh, the gas consumption with this style of ventilator will depend, uh, will vary depending on the fresh gas flow, the settings, and the amount of gas that's used to require the, the vent driver. So if you're redeploying this style of ventilator into an area of your hospital where there's not uh, sufficient uh, bulk gas sources, that's gonna be a huge logistic hurdle for you. You're gonna go through a lot of gases. Um, sometimes these ventilators can be converted over to air to drive, but you'll need to have some sort of uh, certified biomedical person to come in and reprogram the machine. Electrically driven ventilators use electricity to move a piston or a turbine or a slash a blower type uh, ventilator to deliver the tidal volume. Electrically driven uh, ventilators do not consume any driving gas. And the consumption of gas is supplied uh, is, uh, sorry, <clears throat> I'm gonna take a little sip of water here. Okay. Sorry, so the consumption of gases supplied by the central supply or from cylinders is equal to the fresh gas flow of the settings on the machine. So it doesn't really use a lot of medical gases. Uh, gas machines uh, use a constant fresh gas flow to supply the circuit with medical gases, inhaled agents, 
and to flush CO2 out of the circuit and help control humidity. Uh, fresh gas flow is a very important feature on an anesthetic gas machine that you don't really see in an ICU. Most modern anesthetic gas machines are microprocessor controlled and they have an integrated flow sensor and pressure transducers to control vari the variables on how a breath is delivered and provide an electronic patient machine display and an interface to be used by the operator uh, to either monitor the respiratory mechanics and physiological responses and to adjust the settings as indicated. Each company has its own version of its software and how it runs these different features. Now, this is another important principle that is very strictly different than an IC ventilator on a, that you'll find on a gas machine. So anesthetic gas machines operate through a, clo a closed loop circuit with a rebreathing system and a hyperinflation bag to allow the patient to breathe spontaneously or be manually ventilated or to be switched to a mechanical ventilator as they go through the various stages of general anesthesia. Uh, and again, this is a workflow that's completely built around short-term use for providing deep anesthesia to facilitate a procedure and to provide life support as the patient goes into the deepest state of anesthesia when their breathing is suppressed. This feature uses um, a valve or a switch or a lever mechanism to engage and disengage the gas machine's ventilator. When the ventilator is not in use or disengaged, the patient will be in spontaneous or manual ventilation mode and breathing through the hyperinflation side of the system. As well, one can change the APL valve, which stands for Adjustable Pressure Limit Valve, to provide PEEP within the spontaneous mode when you have them on this spontaneous breathing mode uh, to either optimize manual ventilation to put a little resistance like putting a peep valve on a, on a bag valve mask or for lung recruitment. This is, very, this is a very important principle of operation and if it's not well understood it could lead to significant harm to the patient and possibly death if the ventilator is inadvertently disengaged and the patient is left in spontaneous mode without a competent respiratory drive or the P, they get switched into this mode and the APL valve is cranked up too high. So the other thing that's unique about anesthetic gas machines is they have uh, a lot of one-way valves within the circle system and they're very susceptible for pressure building up on the patient end if they become obstructed. And we'll talk about that in a few slides. Gas machines, uh, they rely on a scrubber or an absorber system to remove exhaled CO2. The breathing system uh, also exports exhaled air into a reservoir to be mixed with fresh gas to be delivered in the next breathing cycle as a way to maintain and conserve anesthetic agents. That is very unique to anesthetic gas machines and you won't find that in an ICU ventilator. As a result, the FiO2 delivered can actually be less than what's set on the machine when, it, when it's um, being mixed with the uh, exhaled air, uh, specifically uh, when you're in low fresh gas flow um, uh, uses. So therefore, it is imperative that the continuous FiO2 and the continuous expiratory O2 and inspired CO2 and exhaled CO2 measurements, along with the appropriate settings on your fresh gas flow, uh, are set to ensure that the patient is receiving enough oxygen and CO2 is being removed effectively. For off-label use, it is recommended to set the fresh gas flow 50% higher than the patient minute volume. So um, the other difference between uh, the ICU ventilator uh, and the anesthetic gas machine is um, the ICU ventilator does rely on a scrubbing system to eliminate CO2. So usually having a heated expiratory filter that has an expiratory port. Gas machines also use a gas bench to constantly measure anesthetic agents and relies on electronically integrated pressure transducers, valves, flow sensors that require calibration to ensure accuracy of operation and to prevent malfunctions. And um, 
and said gas machines are designed to be rebooted and restarted every 24 hours to ensure proper calibration, accuracy, and performance. And acidic gas machines also uh, employs a scavenging unit to remove waste gases and to protect the room environment. A lot of anesthetic gas machines, if they have an active system that's uh, part of the breathing system, regardless if you're using volatile agents or not, needs to be engaged. Anesthetic gas machines do not use active humidification and they generally don't do well with nebulized medications and cannot compensate for leaks. So how does this compare to ICU ventilators? Okay, well, so ICU ventilators are designed for long-term use and do not require constant clinical attendance to operate. They do not require daily calibration of flow sensors, pressure transducers, oxygen analyzers, and other components. They're designed to be used with active humidity, nebulized medications, specialty gases, and closed suction systems. Uh, they have uh, less resistance in the inspiratory and expiratory limbs compared to an anesthetic gas machine, easier for the patients to trigger and are leak compensated. The alarms of an ICU ventilator are louder and can be used remotely. And ICU ventilators have backup ventilation modes in case a patient is apneic or the ventilation is inadequate. Uh, they have more advanced modes than anesthetic gas machines. They have lung protective features and settings such as inspiratory and expiratory holds and sigh breaths. They're more sophisticated uh, respiratory mechanics uh, monitoring. Thank you. So more sophisticated respiratory uh, mechanic monitoring calculations, trends, and waveforms that are on display. And most have a heated uh, expiratory filter and an expiratory port that vents uh, CO2 off into the room. And there's no need for a scrubber. So as you can see from the two different technologies, the workflows and requirements are very different. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the workflows with an anesthetic gas machine that you'll have to think about in the forefront of your mind if you're going to redeploy this in an area that's outside of the OR. So um, humidity is a huge problem for anesthetic gas machines. Uh, if the humidity builds up too much within the circuit or within the gas machine, it can cause an obstruction and uh, the patient will not be ventilated. It could also back up into the gas machine, affect its performance, or cause uh, damage to the inside of the machine. So long-term ventilation may result in a buildup of excessive moisture and condensation in the breathing system and can totally degrade the performance of the ventilator sensors. So uh, there's a recommendation that you keep uh, your alarm settings, your airway pressure limit, your low tidal volume, and your minute volumes close to the baseline of the patient you want to be able to have a very small tolerance in case there's resistance that starts to build up in your circuit so that you'll catch it early before it harms the patient. Anesthesia devices use uh, unidirectional valves that may prevent the release of pressure from the patient connection. For example, if the expiratory breathing tube is occluded uh, from uh, the expiratory uh, HEPA filter getting moist. Uh, so one of the ways that you can control the humidity is to increase the fresh gas flow um, and that should help reduce the, uh, the excessive humidity buildup. Now the caveat to that is when you increase the fresh gas flow, you're delivering more drier gases to the patient. So you have to find that medium. So I suggest that you start off at 50% uh, above the patient's minute volume. And if you find that it's too dry, um, you can decrease it uh, in intervals until you get to about the patient's minute volume. You don't want to go below 20% of the patient's minute volume because you'll, you'll be at risk of too much uh, humidity building up as well as it may start to affect your um, FiO2 delivered and what you have set. Okay, next slide. Okay, so for fresh gas flow use, uh, I just thought this was pertinent to talk a little bit about this. And, and if you have any questions about this at the end, we can talk about fresh gas flow because it is a little bit different of a concept than what we use in ICU ventilators. Uh, as I mentioned, um, 
we want to keep the fresh gas flow really high uh, for long-term use. This is actually kind of counter to what we do in the operating room. We use ultra low flow uh, fresh gas flows. Once the patient reaches a, a hemodynamic, or sorry, a, um, a steady state with their gases. And again, that's a strategy that we use not so much for patient uh, physiological response, but it's more uh, around economies and trying to save gases and not having uh, gases being sucked up through the scavenging system. The anesthetic gas is probably the most expensive part of the anesthesia delivery. So there's lots of technologies uh, that use minimal fresh gas flows or even no gas flows uh, to try to minimize um, uh, loss of anesthetic agent. That has no application in the outside OR environment. And in fact, if you lose, uh, if you use low fresh gas flow on a patient has a fever that's infected, septic, and critically ill, you run the risk of um, not meeting their uh, oxygen needs. Uh, because they'll consume more than what the system can put back into it. Higher flesh gas flows will reduce uh, uh, rebreathing and less reliance on the patient's exhaled breath to be blended and will lead to drier gases, um, more stable FiO2s, as well as um, a more efficient way of evacuating CO2. So let's talk a little bit about the alarms because that's another... Uh, difference between ICU ventilators and anesthetic gas machines. Now, uh, the alarms on a anesthetic gas machine uh, are designed uh, for use with a person that's in constant attendance. And I can't emphasize that more. Um, anesthetic gas machines aren't meant to be turned on and then come back and checked on two or three hours later. So uh, the alarms are, are unique to that workflow. Uh, they're not as loud as an ICU ventilator. So if you repurpose the anesthetic gas machine into a non-OR area that may not have constant attendance, um, the alarms should be set to a maximum of 100%, 100% of their volume. Um, the alarms, um, let's see here, I just lost myself, okay. On some of the gas machines, uh, alarm notifications are automatically removed when the alarm situation resolves. ICU ventilators are completely different in this respect. Uh, so most ICU ventilators, if you have alarm condition, it'll stay on the display until you recognize it and either erase it or fix the condition. On a gas machine, if the patient is hitting the high pressure, then the next breath, they don't hit the high pressure, that alarm will disappear. If you're not in the room, you won't know. And there's a potential that there could be increasing resistance in the circuit and it may not get caught because there's nobody in the room to see that alarm go, go off at that point and could lead up to a complete obstruction. And the patient will they'll stop ventilating the patient. So I recommend that uh, you learn how to access the alarm history in the log. And when you go and do your regular routine checks every hour or every couple hours, that you go back and look at that alarm log as well, just to make sure that you haven't hit any of these conditions. Uh, keep the airway limit, low tide volume, and minute uh, alarms close to the baseline uh, so you can surveil properly for occlusions or increased resistance. Especially if you're using HMEs at the Y, if the patient coughs up, and even though it's a brand new HME, if there's a little bit of sputum within it, it may be uh, enough resistance that it'll affect the, the machine. Um, also, I recommend that you, it has a setting for monitoring inspired carbon dioxide. Now, this is what we use in the OR to decide when we're gonna change the absorber. So most uh, companies, they recommend setting your fraction of inspired CO2 alarm at five millimeters of mercury. So once your absorber starts to become exhausted, your inspired CO2 starts to climb because the scrubber can't keep up with it. And when it hits five, that's the time to change the scrubber or your absorbent. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about some of the daily checks. And again, this is a different routine than what we're used to in the ICU. So the use of devices um, without appropriate periodic calibrations 
as per the instructions for use, may result in the degradation of the delivery system and it may affect the performance of the acidic gas machine. So these daily full system checks are extremely important to the modern acidic gas machine. Uh, this is where um, it tests all the uh, electrical compliances and currents of all the different flow transducers and sensors to make sure nothing's drifting. Now the um, um, the oxygen analyzer and the anti CO2 calibrations and the gas bench is separate from the ventilator and it does its own cal while it's in use. But the um, mechanical calibration and pre-use test that's done on a daily basis cannot be done when the patient's attached to the ventilator. So this means that you're going to have to disconnect the patient from the ventilator for a good eight to ten minutes while you do the whole performance test. And that usually is going to require two people to do that. Um, you also want to check for exhausted CO2 absorber. You want to check every four hours or sorry, every 12 hours to see if uh, the CO2 is degrading, uh, the absorber is degrading. Uh, you want a full gas. Uh, there's um, a water trap on all the anesthetic gas machines because it uses a side sampling on a continuous uh, basis to be able to monitor your gases and your oxygen and your CO2. And water will build up in that sample line as well as water will collect in the water trap. And you want to make sure that that water trap is emptied before it hits about half full. If you let it go too much and it fills up, it could slip inside your gas bench and screw everything up. And it's a very expensive repair. So um, make sure that's part of your routine 12 hour checks. Um, you want to increase uh, a look at your hoses to make sure there's no water accumulation in the hoses and excessive condensation in your filters, in your HMEs. And that may lead to increased resistance and an obstruction. So for infection control, uh, gas machines are again a little bit unique compared to ICU. There's some things that are similar, uh, but uh, again, because of its inability to maintain um, the heat, the moisture in an effective way, uh, there's a couple of things you just have to think about. So um, obviously in between patients, you're gonna wipe down all the non-pore surfaces with an approved viral agent. Uh, you gotta change the disposable circuit. Uh, they recommend changing the circuit uh, every 24 hours to every 48 hours, including the sample line. Uh, but you also wanna make sure that you change your filters probably every 12 hours or even 24 hours if they become soiled. And again, that's gonna depend on how much humidity is being put into the circuit. Uh, consider using a heat moisture exchanger with a HEPA grade filtration on it. Put that at the Y, that's at the patient port. You want to make sure that it has an entitled CO2 connection that's on the ventilator side of the HME, not the patient side, because the anesthetic gas machine is constantly drawing uh, from the circuit, and you want it to draw from the clean side, not the dirty side of the filter. You also want to make sure that there's uh, you only use a uh, mechanical uh, filter that's HEPA rated at 99.99% minimum. There's some out there that are 99.99999%, but that would be sort of your starting. Uh, you want to make sure that it's hydrophobic in nature, and that uh, and that's the filter that you're going to use onto your your expiratory port. Most of the gas machines. Uh, if you're using an HME at the Y, recommend that you don't put another HEPA filter on the inspiratory port. It'll cause too much resistance in the circuit. So um, I found a reference on um, uh, the American Society of Anesthesia and the, uh, the Anesthesia uh, Patient Safety Foundation uh, for off-label use uh, as of a gas machine. Uh, in a, uh, as an ICU ventilator. And this is sort of a quick little card that you could use um, if you're not familiar or if this is not part of your routine to help develop a routine. So there's a setup pathway and there's an initiate, uh, initiation of ventilation or therapy pathway. Now obviously you'll have to modify this slightly 
to the type of device that you're using. As well, here's sort of a recommended maintenance or instructions on how uh, you should develop your approach to caring for the ventilator while you have a patient on for long-term use. And it's pretty self-explanatory. Okay, so I also found some resources that you guys can tap into. Um, these are all the different sites that are really kind of guiding the practice of anesthesia during COVID. So uh, you guys can have that or you can, um, uh, there's everything here from uh, the different professional associations and there's a Canadian website that uh, summarizes from the University of Toronto, the guidance on purposing anesthetic gas machines as IC ventures very well. So the only thing that um, I think I didn't really talk about was human resources and who should be really doing this. And I thought maybe that might be an opportunity to have an open discussion. Um, respiratory therapists are very tech savvy and uh, you're very, very, very capable of ventilating any patient. Um, the, the question becomes is during a crisis, is this the time to bring in a technology that you're not familiar with that has such a different workflow around it? And it has a lot of different features on it that you haven't been specifically trained or that you use in your daily practice. Um, what I would suggest is that um, the anesthesiologist and the anesthesia assistants, uh, their, their work volume is really down right now as a result of the ORs that are closing. So some hospitals have sort of redesigned their anesthesia care teams to be in more of a supportive role for the emergency and critical care rooms uh, departments. Everything from um, an airway teams for responding to uh, protected intubations and protected code blues to being able to offer support to the emergency and critical care programs, um, either from a staffing level or to provide technical assistance with any applied devices that you may not be familiar with. All right, and then the last slide here, here's some contacts. So most of the anesthetic gas machines in Canada uh, seem to be from GE and Drager. I know that there's a couple of other uh, vendors out there. Uh, there's Mine Ray, and I think there's some, uh, hopefully some new vendors that are in the market uh, to provide some anesthesia technology. But I think these two companies would probably cover 90% of uh, the ORs in the province um, and there's your con contacts if you have any questions or if you need to retrieve uh, their specific statements and recommendations on repurposing uh, anesthetic gas machines in an off-label fashion. So at that point um, I'm going to say thank you to the RTSO for allowing me to share my experiences with you guys and uh, open it up for questions. Excellent thanks Rob. Uh, so I'll give you guys a couple minutes. Uh, if you want to ask any questions, just uh, put them into the question slash chat box on your side panel of the GoToWebinar. And uh, just as you're thinking about your questions, uh, I'm just going to remind everybody, um, we would, as Rob said at the beginning, we'd love your support. Um, and I want you to understand that this is not this is not about money. Yeah, it costs to become a member, but we're not asking you to do this for money. We're asking you to do this so that we can all support each other throughout any of these kinds of crisis. And like I said earlier, I think this is going to come back until they get a vaccine. And I can foresee potential surges happening in the fall into the winter again when flu season hits. And, you know, we, we've gone back throughout the, the summer to not social distancing and uh, all the other kind of uh, public health measures that we're doing right now because people kind of get lazy. So uh, I'm asking, you know, if you haven't become a member, please consider joining us. If you have, please renew your membership. Uh, and again, we are going to hold uh, at this point a conference in the fall. And uh, obviously some of these topics are going to be at front of mind and uh, we hope to get to uh, some really good speakers and presenters around that. So we will be sending out um, a survey and it, it's more of a three question survey. It's not a long one in terms of uh, kind of what your thoughts are about additional webinars. How can we further support people in the field? 
uh, whether it be anesthesia assistants or respiratory therapists uh, or those working in pulmonary diagnostics or home care. Um, so if you could fill out that three question survey when you get it, it would be very helpful. And again, just uh, type your questions into the question box and we'll have Rob answer them. So uh, I think people are just doing that now, Rob. I'm gonna actually ask a question. So some hospitals and uh, where I work in Barrie, I know they have started to look at a, a tip sheet for um, using anesthetic machines in an ICU setting or for ICU patients. And um, I'm just wondering if if you if your institution has created one yet, or if you know of any any of them that we could share or post on the website. Um, well, I did sort of send you that one in the presentation that you're more than welcome to download from the Anesthesia Society or the American Anesthesia hmm. Society website. Hmm. Um, I, I think a lot of the Anesthesia societies and professional bodies are very apprehensive about providing tip sheets to people that don't have specific training in anesthesia because they're worried that if they don't give them enough information or if they don't have the training, that it could result in a patient death. So I think, um, and again, that's a very uh, American perspective. Um, I think in Canada, I think we're respectful of the fact that there are uniquenesses about the anesthesia system and that uh, I think the culture of respiratory therapy, particularly in Ontario, is very patient-centered. And I'm sure that a lot of people would identify if they have um, some sort of discomfort with applying the device, that they would voice that and get the appropriate uh, support. So obviously one of the logistics during a pandemic is going to be if your staff become infected, you may not have the same people that were there at the beginning of the training with the use of the gas machine if they're off and you have to bring in other resources. As well as you can't have anesthesia assistants and anesthesiologists looking after every single patient on the gas machine uh, that's been redeployed. They may not have the resources of the staffing that provide a 24 hour model. So I would say that this is a real opportunity for the respiratory therapy department to work collaboratively with their anesthesia department to come up with a model that uh, they have appropriate resources for the frontline clinicians that are using the machines and they have somebody that they can call 24 hours if there's a question or if there's a concern. The other thing that I would really emphasize is to make sure that you have a bag valve mass resuscitator on hand in case the machine does fail. Um, and um, I, I hope I gave you enough information uh, for people to to sort of either uh, remind them if uh, this is something that's old to them about the principles of operation of an anesthetic gas machine or if they've never used one or seen one before that there's significant differences that they have to be aware of. Uh, I, I'd hate to put that on to any respiratory therapist to say, okay, now you're in charge of this device even though you had a five-minute YouTube video now here's your sick patient in severe ARDS with an infection, by the way, that you might catch. So uh, it's it's pretty scary times. And um, I would also suggest that when your ICU ventilator becomes available, switch that patient off the gas machine and put them on that ICU ventilator. And then use that IC, the gas machine as another backup in case you need it. Um, our hospitals out there, are the anesthesia department not involved with the redeployment of the gas machines or are our T departments and ICUs just sort of taking them? I'm going to guess that most anesthesia departments are involved. But um, right. I have a couple questions, so I want to move on to a couple of, there's some questions coming in now. Sure. So here's the first one. Between patients, should the block go to uh, wherever they call it SPD for reprocessing? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, most of the manufacturers uh, say that if you use your uh, uh, proper HEPA filters in line, um, uh, if you have a spare block, uh, you can send it down to be cleaned if you feel that it's a higher grade of uh, infection control. Um, but if you use your HEPA filters properly, uh, the machine should be safe from any contamination. 
So, but if you feel that your filters have been compromised at all, uh, you should send your block down to be uh, reprocessed. Great, that's good, thanks. Uh, the next question is, is so the person's asking, um, for 24 hours for circuit change, why the significant difference from changing disposable circuits on vents? If we're constantly checking the circuit for moisture and there is none, why would we change it every 24 hours? Right, so um, again, you have to look at how the machines are designed for use. Um, Anesthetic gas machines uh, have a different flow uh, and uh, with the closed system, there's a chance for, um, uh, I would say, uh, more so with the filters and the sample lines uh, that have to be um, changed and cleaned. So uh, this again, this is just a recommendation from uh, an IPAC resource. If your if your circuit is not grossly contaminated, uh, and if you feel comfortable changing the um, uh, the HME and the mechanical filter at the expiratory port and your sample line on a daily basis, you still have to do the full check. Right, and okay. don't forget there's a hypertension bag as well. So you have to be um, the circuit on an anesthetic gas machine. It's a little bit different than an ICU circuit. Um, if you use the ones that have swivel ports or swivel connections on them at the Y, um, they can wear down after a period of time and they, they're subject to, uh, to leaks. So after you change your filters and you do uh, your full system check, if you don't have any significant leaks, it's probably okay to use. Uh, if there are leaks, you have to change it. Because you got to remember that Yanisette gas machines are not leak compensated and if you start to get uh, leaks developing in the in the circuit it'll affect the performance of the machine and the ventilation of the patient. Okay that's good thanks. Uh, next question is, is should there be continuous monitoring by a trained RT anesthesia assistant of two to three machines maximum? So basically I think they're asking you know what kind of uh, ratio if, if there's any kind of recommendations around that, if they were to be used as IC events? Well, I, I think again, um, I think having an anesthesia trained clinician uh, immediately available uh, is probably an asset to the team in caring for multiple patients on a gas machine. But having three patients uh, that you have to look over, there's no such thing as constant attendance of uh, Three patients with one clinician in three different ICU rooms. So I think what's more important is that as um, long as there's somebody that's there to recognize an alarm that's going off and be able to call somebody right away and recognize that if it's a critical failure with the gas machine that they could go in and manually ventilate the patient until help arrives. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, would insulating the circuit help prevent with moisture buildup by pre preventing drastic drops in temperatures? Uh, that's a good question. I don't think I've come across anything like that in the anesthesia world. Um, I, I, again, um, it's because there's no uh, heater mechanism within the circuit to maintain the relative humidity, as well as um, you know the vir the uh, the resistance of the circuit itself and the filter that's on it. Uh, I think also lends itself to um, a buildup of humidity within it. So unlike an ICU ventilator where you have heated wires in it um, that can maintain a constant temperature and and stop the particulates from raining out, you don't have that in an anesthetic gas machine. So the amount of humidity also may accumulate based off of your fresh gas flow. So you just got to make sure you keep your fresh gas flow up high. Some uh, modern gas machines have a heater plate that's integrated into the breathing system, but not everyone has that. Okay, great. So I, that's all the questions for now, but I want to touch on something. So, and I'm going to put this out to the rest of the people on the call right now on the webinar. Um, I had, you know, one thought was when we do inspire, because we've learned lessons, because we've been doing planning, I'm wondering if 
uh, the different centers out across our province, both you know, kind of urban and rural centers, if uh, there's specific models of care that uh, have emerged from some of your planning and maybe some of your implementation, specifically I'm thinking in the bigger centers, Toronto, obviously, Hamilton, um, and maybe even Windsor, because I know they have quite a few patients. But uh, looking at like, because Rob, you described kind of what your model is in McKenzie Health, we have a different model in RVH. It's uh, uh, kind of led by IC our intensivists, and then they're calling them ICU extenders. So those are the physicians from emergent anesthesia who will actually almost be like the ICU helpers to the physicians, um, because our ICU physicians were very adamant in saying, we need to let the right people do the right job. So the RTs already know how to ventilate. We don't want other people you know, kind of looking at stepping into that role when they're not really competent on how to ventilate these sick patients. So there's different, and then I know they have a, a nursing model they're developing as well. So it'd be really interesting to see or hear from you guys in terms of how many models are out there and could we have a panel discussion at Inspire and a, a bit of a presentation around the different models? Because I know some of the smaller centers, so I work in Midland, and, um, you know, it's very, like you said, Rob, uh, anesthesia is not that busy in the OR right now. So they're looking for other things to do. And it would be interesting to see, could they adapt their model if we do go back into a surge situation later on in the year um, from what they've got now to maybe something that's best practice and that's been tried and true. So I would ask that if anybody, um, has a model that you've either implemented or planned around and you see some good benefits to it and it includes a team approach because to me that's one of the important things is if contact us at office at rtso.ca and we'll i think we'll put together a panel that looks at this so rob we'll probably be asking you to join that too just so you know <laughs> sure no, I think you make a really good point. Um, this is unprecedented times, right? So I think everybody wants to roll up their sleeves and jump in there and help out as much as they can. This isn't about um, barriers and territories. This is about utilizing resources to the most effectiveness of their abilities in a collaborative way to be able to meet a need. So at our hospital, uh, yeah, they, they did repurpose the anesthesia department slightly. Uh, so we had uh, anesthesia assistants that were on just during the day and in the afternoon until 11.30 at night. And they changed their staffing model to have one anesthesia assistant in-house 24 hours. So partly that was to uh, assist the anesthesiologist with, an, um, I guess, an increase in workload in responding to protected code blues and protected intubations where we kind of worked as airway teams, as well as to... Uh, be a little bit more integrated in the anesthesiologist's practice within the OR with emergency operations when it came to uh, now our, our workflows were all changed uh, because of our equipment's not in the room from an infection control perspective. So we need runners, we need people to uh, be don and doffing partners, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, as well as labor and delivery can continues to have babies. So you have to make sure that on top of all the emergency responses that you're still able to provide anesthesia to other critical areas. Uh, so our focus was really um, sort of a support role to emerge the ICU, uh, the respiratory therapy department. So for all my caseload kind of settles down at night, I'll go to the intensive care unit and offer assistance to the respiratory therapist if they need any within my little scope. So I think we all got to find our way to support each other. Um, the, the other thing that I wanted to remark about that I didn't really put in the slides, but and now that I think about it, um, the other recommendation that a lot of the organizations and companies are putting out there is to remove your volatile agents off your anesthetic gas machines, as well as to disconnect your uh, nitrous tank off the back if you have that on your gas machine. The ICU is not the environment for volatile agents and nitrous oxide. Uh, they could be great harm to the staff uh, with the secondhand gases, as well as if it accidentally gets turned on, it can complicate the patient's condition quite uh, grossly. So uh, that's something else to, to remember. 
Great point. Yeah. Okay, so it's uh, it's four o'clock, and I just want to say thanks to everybody who's joined. Um, this has been recorded, so the recording will be put up within about two days on the RTSO website. So if there's others that wanted to see it, uh, you can go on there and get the link. And again, thank you, Rob, so, so much uh, for agreeing to speak today. I'm sure that uh, everybody uh, enjoyed your talk, and, and I think the resources that you've provided are going to be extremely helpful as we go through this. So thanks everybody, and uh, we will see you probably next week, uh, whoever wants to join. We have two webinars planned. Uh, you'll be getting the links through the CRTO probably on Saturday, I think, uh, just because I have to do all the work ahead of time. Uh, and one is around uh, mental health uh, for respiratory therapists in this time of COVID. And the other one will be with uh, kind of a question and answer period with uh, Fisher and PayCal. So we'll hopefully see you uh, in the, in next week sometime. Thanks so much for uh, attending. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, Sue. Okay, bye-bye.